Hello everybody, Steve Bauman here, and today I'm going to be talking about an artist that I really appreciate. He's a German 19th century painter called Adolf Menzel. He was really, really popular in his own day, and in Germany in particular, but maybe the outside world and the contemporary art appreciation world is not so tuned into him. I think that if you're a painter, an oil painter specifically, you work in figurative subjects, probably you know who Adolf Menzel is, but he's someone that I just wanted to express is not kind of known by the world's population in the way that, say, a Rembrandt or a Vermeer might be. In fact, it's one of those things that I always remember finding so shocking when I was a student, is that I was learning about these painters from the 18th and 19th century that were so absolutely incredible. I mean, just heartbreakingly fantastic artists and I'd never even heard their names before, let alone seeing kind of a catalog of their work. So it's this vast population of really amazing but semi-unknown artists that have just been cast aside by history and, and appreciation in modern times. To be totally fair, I don't want to make it seem like he's this unknown artist. If you're a painter who loves figurative work, probably you're going to know who Adolf Menzel is. But for the rest of you who are just getting introduced to this stuff, maybe this guy is someone that you've not yet appreciated. But let's go ahead and get straight to the work so we can talk about all the things that kind of make him so interesting. So this first painting that we're going to focus on is probably the one that you know of if you only know of Menzel in somewhat of a passing sense. It's a really super iconic image and I think it kind of taps into or shows us a little bit about what his world is like. He's someone who, in his day, the critics would always talk about in terms of how true his paintings were, in the sense that he didn't manicure things, he didn't give us this uh, ideal or perfected version of something. He was always, in that almost Caravaggio-esque sense, searching for like the truth of the matter, right? Like Caravaggio painting the Madonna but with dirty feet, right? It was very controversial in its day. And while Menzel, I don't think, inspired that same kind of controversy, it was that spirit that he was prized for. Now you can see in the painting that there's a very direct approach. We have this sense that the, the paint that we see on this last layer is the paint that he absolutely applied right on the surface. Maybe there are some moments, like we look into the shadow here, where we have some glazes that have been left behind from previous layers. There are definitely going to be things about this work in particular where it has that beautiful kind of unfinished sense to it. At the same time, a really beautiful and strong sense of volume and form. And I think this again is something that I look at Immensel's work and I see it as this beautiful combination, this tension or friction almost, in between something that has these parts which totally look like they have been left behind and these other parts that are really so fully realized, right? And so for me, it's that, it's that tension in between those two kind of modes of representation that I think makes him such an exciting painter and it's definitely the thing where we look at it and we appreciate it as painters ourselves. We want somebody who appreciates and shows us a little bit about the material that we love so much. Now, speaking about the color inside of this, I do have some curiosities as to whether or not kind of over time, like some of the pigments have kind of darkened a little bit or we've had some like uh, desaturation that's taken place. Maybe there were some fugitive pigments that he was using on his palette, but it does create a really beautiful effect eventually. But like I said, it, it does make me wonder, you know, if some of the paint has gone a little bit more transparent than it was. Who can say from a technical level exactly what it was? But suffice to say, it's left behind what I would find a really strange and interesting appearance in terms of like, if I was painting this picture, I'm not sure that I would have like that diverse a set of values inside the light shape of the toe. I probably would have unified that a little bit more. More like he has done maybe in a plane like, uh, like this one, where we see a lot of color diversity going from kind of cool to warm temperatures but at the same time, the, the value of it is really, really unified. So some interesting choices and some things I think that probably had something revealed in them over time. Look at this shadow through here. So much beautiful reflected light going into that shadow. Now that's something that for me, and again, I always kind of reference this to my own work, if I was looking at this shadow shape, I would, my first instinct of course would be to kind of unify those values and kind of take away a lot of the variety in there. But he's, of course, not really beholden to any, any technique. 
And that's something that, as we move on to talk about his drawings, I think you're going to find really interesting is there is this sense of kind of fluidity in his work, which is to say like he's not married to any one technique at all. So this is the next painting I want to talk about, and it's actually probably the first one that I saw that really made me fall in love with Menzel. It's a cast wall in a studio drawn with this really steep and intense sense of perspective. And so it's really beautiful. All of these wonderful like kind of overlapping forms, right? You have one cast and then another cast overlapping again and again and again. Is this intense sense of drama that's kind of caused by the really steep perspective that we find looking up into the noses of these casts and directly into the faces of these casts lower down here. So that accompanying this really strong kind of dramatic underlit effect is something that I think if you've worked in a studio or worked in an academy or you're somebody who's a sculptor, you have a studio at home or, or a studio where you know, you're working in there at night, sometimes these underlit scenes have this really extra and intense sense of drama to them. And of course, that's what draws every kind of young painter to a painting like this one where really the emotion is uh, so on its sleeve, right? Taking just these things that have such a niche population of people who will appreciate them, people specifically probably who have studied classical sculpture or who have studied casts as, as an academic, this is who it's appealing to. And we can even pick out, now I'm guessing here, but we can even pick out in this one, Beethoven's death mask. Or actually, I wonder, is it a life mask? I've heard divergent views about this, whether the Beethoven cast that we all know and love. In any event, like a really beautiful, really dramatic painting. And it just goes to show that the way that he was looking at the world is so consumed, for me at least, in the particular. There's all these arrangements of like kind of calipers and measuring instruments down here and here where you see that they are chosen to be kind of a part of the composition, but they are jumbled. They're almost a little bit of a mess. And it's this uh, way that he accepts that mess that I find really so intriguing and so lifelike about what he does. I mentioned earlier how in his day critics would really praise him for not kind of washing things clean, for not making an idealized picture of something, but for picking out exactly those things that make it commonplace, that make it feel very lived in. And that's always the sense that I've gotten about his work. So another art student special here. The cast wall has now been looked at from a different perspective. We're looking kind of straight at these casts, even though they're still underlit, a strong kind of vertical sense, that light kind of coming up from the bottom casting these fanning out sort of dramatic shadows in every direction. Really, really interesting. The light kind of coming out of that corner, like I said, and kind of bursting onto the scene, uh, letting planes that are facing downward like these on a hand catch a ton of light and then other edges like the form at the edge of the arm here, almost being totally kind of lost into shadow. Another cool thing that he's doing with this that I think for painters we tend to really, really appreciate is he has that wonderful ability, right? And some of us have it more than others. Some of us are trying really hard to get there. But that ability to kind of leave things as they are, right? You could see that the strokes of the brush that have gone through the lay-in of the kind of local color of the wall here within the light shape, they are still looking almost exactly like they would at the block-in. And I love his way of kind of preserving that sense of freshness. It's quite possible really that he maybe has just painted this in one session or one pass and this is why that, that freshness remains there. It's also possible that he's someone who simply appreciated that aspect of it and really attempted to kind of maintenance and hold on to that sense of kind of freshness that's given us by one color kind of passing through another one. We can see here this intense warmth, probably from something like an imprimatura, right? A first layer or a wash of color on a canvas that was maybe made in umber or something like that. So we have this warm brown underpainting and we have then also on top of that a cool gray kind of scumbled over that. You see it also really clearly down here when the, the value has gotten quite high that a sort of red orange or yellow orange underpainting and that beautiful cool gray that he kind of sits right on top of that 
the juxtaposition of those two temperatures being really so beautiful next to each other. So another really fantastic painting focusing on subjects that for myself, you know, I spent maybe 15 years at the academy uh, altogether between being a student and a teacher, uh, that for me these subjects are really intimate and really beautiful and, and I appreciate them so much in his work. But let's get on to his drawings because here is where I think Menzel is such an interesting subject in that the sense of fluidity I talked about earlier, that sense of not being married to a technique really, really comes alive. You can see here an incredible grasp over the sense of proportion, construction, uh, three-dimensionality, value, impression, all the things that you want in a drawing are there. But when you start analyzing and assessing what is the technique, what is the actual method or process of application, for sure we have to say that there must be one because an artist so prolific as he was definitely has a practiced method of one form or another. However, it is both naturalistic and in a way that Menzel's drawings almost just look like Menzel's drawings. They don't really look like anything else. We can see also in the next drawing here where he is attached to this very beautiful soft turning sense of form across the forehead and also has chosen a solution for the hair that really reflects again that sense of like randomness and chaos of nature that things are not orchestrated but that he's kind of going with the flow in a sense not afraid to find a very beautiful kind of s-curve that flows through the hair but at the same time he's just as willing to talk about in his work the scribbly looking hairs that a, a curly beard will will have so he's got both of those kind of like polar opposites represented in a sense those two things living in the same world is not something we always find in really beautiful kind of highly rendered work sometimes it gets rendered a little bit too much if we have a critique of Bouguereau probably will say where are the hairs like this where are the things that are so particular to reality that maybe remind us of how now we're on to some of the best drawings that I think of when I think of Mensel. We can see here again this lack of fear to show all of the individual hairs and we can see such an incredible sensitivity to kind of turning form and volume. If we look at for a moment the sense of crispness in this contour line and the sense of lost edge as this value makes its gradation from light to dark and turns into the hair before we return to this idea of these kind of individual hairs that are also crisp edges of their own. The management and creativity of kind of showing value and form and texture on the surface of something while not overcomplicating it here, I think is so dramatic. And it's some of the coolest stuff that he does. I think seems to be for me both full of detail and incredibly simple. Coming on now to the last drawing that I'm going to talk about today. We see this really beautiful charcoal technique again. For those of you that are kind of familiar with working in charcoal, you'll recognize something in this that I think is really interesting, really incredible. He has this way to hold off on creating hard edges. How many of us, when we are drawing this ear, for instance, would have given it this super crisp edge around that would have drawn so much attention to that contour? but he hasn't done it. He's held off. He's made this ear almost a kind of a soft cloud of light that is within the darkness of the hair. The same thing with the shadow edges on the side plane of the nose, the cast shadow from the nose and the inner upper corner of the eye socket. All of those edges are held to be really, really soft in relationship to some of the hardest edges where we have perhaps here on the forehead uh, a hard edge before we go from the light of the forehead into the darkness of the hair. If we look for another hard edge, we see the light of the chin versus the darkness of her collar sitting just behind it. Choosing these edges for him must have been obviously super crystal clear in terms of their compositional purpose. Even the darkness of her, I want to say hair decoration, or is it just hair that's done up in a bun? Anyway, this dark edge against a light background, he's even managed to keep that quite soft so that our attention can stay here where the detail is, where the emotion is, where the particular amazing turn of the upper lip that gives so much expression and emotion to this face, where that lives, that is where the attention is, and he's not going to distract us with having super sharp edges in these sort of random or peripheral areas. That level of restraint and that level of kind of mastery over portraiture, I think is what really draws me to Menzo. Not forgetting, of course, that his studio interiors are the thing that really, really drew me to him. 
And I then came to appreciate his drawings through that. Common, we all are. So that's where we're gonna leave it for today. That's Adolf Menzel, M-E-N-Z-E-L, an absolutely fantastic German 19th century artist. The artworks of his that you're gonna to wanna to find in addition to this are his studies of armor. Really beautiful, amazingly detailed stuff that's rendered in this way that is both free and open, but also super concise and descriptive. In a way, I guess that description kind of sums up what I think about Menzel's work in general. Once again, thank you so much for watching. And if you like the content on my channel, please remember to like and subscribe. And if you're interested in tutorials about portraiture, drawing and painting in general, you can visit my Patreon page. I think there's a link on this side of the video, but I never seem to remember the right side that it's on anyway, so it could just as easily be here. Anyway, thanks again for watching. Take care of yourselves.